Uh-huh. Um, all right, so the first thing is on Monday, uh, I'm not going to be here. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. You can watch videos from last spring. Yeah. You could probably, I could probably get you guys into this room and you could watch a video from last. <laughs> um, so that would be the uh, 10th. <laughs> could be. Um, so last time, what were we talking about? Area moment of inertia, and why are we talking about that? Yeah, needed for, yes, the stress due to the bending moment. So, so we're calculating the stress due to the bending moment. Uh, what element of stress is that going to be? What, what sporting type of sporting event is it explained by? No. <laughs> Maybe in some way. <laughs> Yeah, the track thing, remember? So the reason that it's a um, it's an X, X stress because the longer side uh, is in tension and the shorter side is in compression. Um, and because of this, uh, we had to introduce, um, was it there were two mathematical things, right? Or is there just one? Didn't we have to do two? Oh, the neutral axis. So the neutral axis is a pretty sim simple concept. It's just like it's the z-axis, but it's located uh, going through the centroid. We're done with that. And now we're talking about the area moment of inertia. And I gave you formulas for the two simple shapes that we'll need to know. Um, so for a rectangle, if this is W and this is H, then, uh, yep, that's... Yeah, W doesn't look like that. W H cubed over 12. And then the only other shape we need is a circle. This is H. Um, so if this is capital R, then the area moment of inertia is... Uh, I R to the fourth over four. Okay, so um, just like with mass moment of inertia, if you're in dynamics, um, you can build up complicated shapes as a sum of simple shapes. Um, as a sum of simple shapes. Um, so here's the idea. If you have, um, if you want to calculate the moment of inertia of this thing, you can break that up into rectangle one, rectangle two, rectangle three. Um, the key is 
all of those so the moment of inertia of the whole thing is going to be the moment of inertia of one plus the moment of inertia of two plus the moment of inertia of three but there's one thing that you have to deal with and that is the moment of inertia of the whole thing needs to be about the neutral axis of the whole thing. So you find the centroid of the whole thing, be up here somewhere. And then this is the neutral axis. Uh, so let me call this A. Okay. And that means that you have to, so the total moment of inertia about A is equal to the moment of inertia of rectangle 1 about A, 2 about A, and 3 about A. Well, the formula doesn't, doesn't give these about A, but um, the moment formula um, doesn't give, uh, you know, it for axis A, it gives it for that shape's own neutral axis. You know what I mean? Uh, the so I gave you formulas for the moment of inertia about about the neutral axis, right? And I, so I we have a formula for the moment of inertia of rectangle one, the moment of inertia of rectangle two, moment of inertia of rectangle three. But the problem is that formula gives the moment of inertia of one about its own neutral axis, which is up here. It gives the moment of inertia of two about its own neutral axis, which is there. And it gives the moment of inertia of three about its own neutral axis, which is there. So that's not what we need to add these up. And we're going to get around that with parallel axis theorem. Right. So the parallel axis theorem says uh, the moment of inertia of a body about some axis A is equal to the moment of inertia about the neutral axis plus exactly what so if your sister was held hot, hot <laughs> that worked so well in dynamics um so what would you and you had to guess the formula for the parallel axis theorem and you liked your sister what would what would you guess is the additive term ad squared because we don't have math here exactly ad squared Yeah, if you haven't had, if you haven't had dynamics, you can't. You have no guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It's, so if you're in dynamics, today is not. So don't worry about it. Um, we're dealing with areas instead of masses. So instead of mv squared, it's a squared. Okay. So what is the area? That's the area of um of the shape. I'm going to do an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. So, so in dynamics, if I asked your prediction, well, now I'm telling you that the answer is MD squared. So you can say that and pretend it's a prediction. And everyone will think you're as smart as everyone thinks Mike is right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, 
So uh, let's do an example. Um, So let's say we have an I-beam. Uh, Well, I guess, I, you know what I mean, an I-beam. Those things that they hit people with in uh, Wile E. Coyote. Um, so why do, they, why do they make beams this cross-sectional shape? Uh, so this is, um, with the coordinate system that we use for beams, that's x, that's y, and that's z. Why do they make them that shape? It obviously would be a lot easier to manufacture something that uses the same amount of material, but it's round. Um, why are beams shaped like this? Um, well, the answer is that it's a very, uh, for a given amount of material, it's a very efficient way to shape the cross section uh, to get um, the area moment of inertia as high as you can. So it has a very large moment of inertia. So let's calculate the moment of inertia. Um, so let's say, so now we're looking at the cross section. Well, yeah, I haven't said what we use it for yet, but uh, we'll see it in the formula. But basically, uh, intuitively, the Area moment of inertia tells you how resistant a cross-sectional shape is to bending. So if you have a, remember I did this demonstration? This is a low uh, area moment of inertia, and it's easy to bend. Um, this is a high moment of inertia, and with that same moment, I can't bend it. All right, so let's say that this length is 0 0.05, no, 0 0.5 meters. It's a big beam. Just the z-axis, that's all we're dealing with. But um, if it was bending about a different axis, you'd have to, you know, has different area moment of inertia for different uh, bending axes. Uh, this distance is also 0.5. And then the thickness everywhere is one centimeter. It is. And there is the centroid of this shape. We know that from, you know, because that's a line of symmetry. So that means our z-axis is this, and our y-axis is this. And where's the x-axis? Towards us. Yep. Out of the page. Uh, all right, so I'm going to break this up into rectangle one, rectangle two, and this is three. Um, so rectangle one. The area moment of inertia about its own neutral axis, so I'll call that I1 about its own, I don't know, neutral axis 1, is 
um, the width, 0.5, times the height cubed, 0 0.01 cubed, divided by 12. So you get this tiny thing, uh, 3.25 times 10 to the minus 4 meters to the fourth. And so now you're, you're already sort of wondering, like, really? That's, like, really going to be helpful? Look how little that area moment of inertia is. But it's not that contribution that's going to be important. The contribution is going to come from the parallel axis theorem part because we have all of that area move far away from the, the total shapes neutral axis. Okay, so this is what I'm going to call A. And now... Um, the moment of inertia of 1 about A is 3.25 times 10 to the minus 4 plus the area of that shape, which is 0 0.05, uh, no, 0 0.005, times the distance from A to the neutral axis of 1. What's that? 0 0.25 plus 0 0.05. 0.255. And so the total is, oh no, that's the total. <laughs> so I don't know what this is. Can someone calculate that? It's going to be smaller. This total thing is 3.25 times 10 to the minus 4. Just calculate that first one. Oh, it's going to be 4.67 times, oh, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay, so this contribution is really small. Almost the entire contribution of it, percentage-wise, comes from the fact that that area has moved far away from the whole shape's neutral axis. Um, rectangle 2 is going to be exactly the same. Can you see how that works? Oh. 4.67. Uh, but the story is still the same. Like the the contribution to the moment of inertia of the shape itself is very small. Almost the entire contribution just comes from moving that shape far from the overall neutral axis. Um, well, we'll see what the whole thing is. Um, these numbers are like think of. Uh, these are small areas compared to, think of our, our reference, um, SI units is meters to the fourth. So uh, unless all of our distances are on the order of a meter, it's going to be a really small number. You know what I mean? So this one works exactly the same way. The moment of inertia of rectangle 2 about A is, oh, and, and this is wrong, 4.167 times 10 to the minus 8. And it's going to be the same thing, 4.167 times 10 to the minus 8 plus 0 0.005 times 0 0.255 squared. You get the same thing. And then we have to deal with rectangle 3. So the moment of inertia of rectangle 3 about its own neutral axis, which also happens to be the neutral axis of the whole thing. 
So, you know, for this one, the neutral axis of 3 is equal to A. So the moment of inertia is a height of 0.5 uh, cubed times the width of 0 0.01 divided by 12. And that's out of my ability. I probably have it here. I can't read it. Okay, 1.04, I'll just call it that, uh, times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. And so the total. is uh, 6.5 plus 1.04, so 7 point, well, I have it here as 7.55 times 10 to the minus 4 meters to the fourth. Now, we could, um, we could calculate that total area, the total cross-sectional area, and figure out how big a circular shape would have to be that had the same amount of material. And if we calculated the area moment of inertia for that circular shape, what would we get, smaller or bigger? Less resistance, a much smaller moment of inertia. Let's do it, okay? Yeah, thank you. We did not because the neutral axis of rectangle three is the neutral axis of the whole thing. Yep. Yes. No, nope. just vertical distance because they're horizontal lines. So what if we melted this I-beam down? Uh, the orientation makes a difference. But you're right that moving it off to the side doesn't make a difference. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, you know, I, uh, I'm not exactly picturing what you're talking about, but you should just, like, if you're curious about it, just do a couple shapes and calculate, and, you know, I think that's a good exercise. Um, so what if you melted the I-beam down? And reformed it. This is not a practical thing. Um into a beam with the same length and circular cross-section. Okay, so the total area is, we already calculated the areas of the top and bottom. Uh, those are 0 0.005. So the total area is 0 0.005, there's two of those, plus another 0 0.005, that's the vertical piece. And so we get 0 0.015 meters cubed. Those are just the areas of those three triangles, just adding them together. Those aren't triangles. You know what I mean. I'm still working on my shapes. <laughs> okay, so now, now we can figure out what the radius of this thing would have to be to get that shape. Um, so pi 
r squared is equal to 0 0.015. So um, r is equal to 0 0.015 over pi square root. So what do you get for that? Zero point zero six nine meters. Yeah, because we're it's the same amount of material, and so since we're making it the same length, it has to have the same area. That's right. Um, and so then the area moment of inertia of this new beam. pi times 0 0.069 to the fourth over four. And what do you get for that? Yep. Point eight times 10 to the okay, one, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Minus fifth meters fourth. And so um, the answer is, even though we have the same amount of material, taking that I-beam shape and changing it into a round solid shape reduced our area moment of inertia um, by more than a factor of 10, you know, a huge amount. Um, was it more than a factor of 10? Yeah, way more. Uh, yeah. Um, so IA was reduced by a factor of And so um, what that means, if you if you put the same loads on that beam, this round cross-section beam would bend much more drastically than the, than the I-beam. That's the whole point of an I-beam. Um, that's the benefit of an I-beam. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, not super safe. It does. Although, I, actually, I would feel safer eating my lunch on an I-beam than on a round beam, I guess, too. I know, that's crazy. That's insane. Not tied or anything. I'm very glad I live now and not then. Yeah. Um, so, finally... That's it for the mathematical preliminaries. Now we can finally give. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Unless you. Unless you. Right. Exactly. Well, no, if you know that that's going to happen. <laughs> but if you don't know it's going to happen, you have to do it. But yeah, you're right. It didn't even, you'd have to go out to four significant figures or five significant figures to even see it appear. You know, it's funny. Um, so now the formula for stress due to bending moment. Sigma xx is equal to negative bending moment times y, I'll tell you what that y refers to, divided by i. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you can trust the sign on this so you don't have to think about directions or anything if you use 
the sign conventions for M and Y and I, um, that sign will come out right. That's the bending moment at that point on the beam. Um, so M is the bending moment. Um, that's right. And the reason it will come out positive, well, that's one reason, because well, this can be positive or negative. Um, I is the area moment of inertia. And y is the y coordinate of the point of interest. Okay, so um, let's do an example where all we have is tension compression and bending moment. So we won't have any shear forces and we won't have any torques. And so now we can calculate for, for this example, we'll be able to calculate the entire stress tensor of this beam at whatever point we want. So let's say we have um, this beam. And we have a force of 1,500 newtons that way and an equal and opposite this way. And couples at both ends. This one is like this. That's 200 Newton meters. And this one is like this. And let's say that we want to calculate um, the stresses at the midpoint. So what are the stress tensors at the midpoint? And now we have to think in all these different directions. Uh, midpoint in the x direction. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I could have drawn this arrow the other way and written that as negative 1,500. And drawn this as, yeah, drawn this couple going counterclockwise and written it as negative 200. Okay. Yeah, you can do this. Okay, um, so uh, what are the stress tensors at the midpoint in X as a function of Y? And actually, we could even do this as functions of x and y and just calculate it for every point, but we're not going to do that. And let's say the cross section, oh, I need a length. Uh, oh, no, I don't need a length. It doesn't even matter. Um, and here's the cross section. It's a square with lengths of 0.2 meters in both directions. Z and Y, exactly. So Y is like this, and Z is like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Luke would be looking from the right side towards it, or Luke's baby sometimes. I, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a, I, think I, I don't think I put those lecture videos up yet, but you and your babies were examples when, the day that you were gone. <laughs> There's some funny drawings and stuff. It depends what point you're looking at. So, the midpoint in X, so we're looking at this dotted line. So we're seeing how it varies as we look at this point and this point and this point. So there's just going to be a Y. Yep. 
Okay, so first we have to calculate the internal loads at that point. So the cut. So we have these, uh, 200 Newton meters, a force of 1,500, and then T, V, M. What? Uh, there's only one cut here because we're only calculating the stress in a single oh, and, and even if we weren't, it, it turns out in this case that there's only one cut. Right. That's exactly right. So uh, Newton's law says um, negative fifteen hundred zero. plus T minus V is equal to zeros. So T is equal to 1,500. In other words, this beam is in tension, and that makes sense if you look at the, the overall picture. V is zero. That's lucky, because we don't know how to calculate the stress due to shear force. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, the moment equation, we have positive 200 plus m is equal to zero. So m is equal to negative 200. OK, so the total stress. What? M is minus 200, right? They're both going counterclockwise. They're just on different legs of the journey. Oh, Aaron always falls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, like, if you think about it, circle has all these different parts. All of these are counterclockwise. Maybe you've never thought about a circle like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all of those are counterclockwise. So you can use, you can print this out and use it as a diagram, hold it up to your picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like that one. It's still counterclockwise. Um, OK, so uh, the total stress is equal to the stress due to tension plus the stress due to bending moment plus the stress due to shear force plus the stress due to torque. And there's no shear force or torque. So we just have to calculate the stresses due to these and add them up. OK, so first of all, the one due to tension, sigma xx is equal to t over the cross-sectional area. t was positive 1,500. You have to remember those signs. Area is 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. So that's 0 0.04, uh, 1,500 divided by uh, 37,500. OK, well, that's actually a very small stress, but that's the what are the units? Yeah. Fifteen. 
37,000. Okay. Um, and so the stress tensor due to tension, uh, you know, that's the X element. So you got that, and then zero is everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And now we have to deal with the bending moment. Okay, so, well, what does this say? Uh, let's look back at that cross section. So that says that no matter where we are on this face, the stress tensor due to tension is the same. Like at the top, the bottom, the middle, anywhere, side to side, the stress tensor is the same due to tension. That's not going to be the case for the stress tensor due to the bending moment. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so um, we have to calculate the area moment of inertia. Uh, what's the width of this cross section? 0.2. What's the height? Yep, so 0.2 times 0.2 cubed divided by 12. So what do you get? <laughs> I have 0 0.2 to the, that's got to be 32 divided by 12. It's about uh, th 3 uh, times 10 to the. Oh. 1 point what? Times 10 to the what? You have 4. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can do either one. Oh, well. Only the point two is cubed and then multiply it by point. Oh, I see. I see. You don't have to think about that stuff. Just plug it into your calculator like it looks there. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's the bending, that's the area moment of inertia. Uh, and so then the stress due to bending is negative times the bending moment. What was that, positive 200? Negative 200? Positive? Negative. So negative from the formula, then negative 200 for m. And then we're trying to write it as a function of y, and then divided by 1.33 times 10 to the minus 4. Well, we're trying to come up with an answer as a function of y. So what's 200 divided by 1.33 times 10 to the minus 4? times 10 to the 6 y. And so the stress tensor due to uh, bending moment is 1.5 times 10 to the 6 y, and then zeros everywhere else. And so finally, the total stress tensor you get from adding these tensors together element by element. So the stress tensor is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the 6 times y plus, was it positive 1,500 for tension? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the stress, 37,500. And then zeros everywhere else. Okay, so now where are you most concerned about 
this thing. It turns out that the X position didn't matter at all. I, I said it was right at the middle of the beam, but that didn't matter. Uh, no matter where we did our cut, those would have the bending moment and the tension would have come out the same. But so where on the cross section are we most concerned about this beam? Points, so points away from the middle always have the biggest stress due to the bending moment. And usually those are symmetric. But this one, the total answer is not symmetric because the contribution from the tension is positive. So, right, so we're going to have the most concerned about this thing breaking where this is positive. You know what I mean? And so let's calculate it at the top. Let's do it at the bottom too, and you'll see how that works. Uh, so what's the value of y at the top? Yeah, good, positive 0.1. So um, sigma xx is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the 6 times 0.1 plus 37,500. And what do you get? 1.5 times 10 to the 5. One two point so like eighty seven. Wait. This is so when you multiply these out you get a hundred fifty thousand plus this, right? So a hundred eighty seven. From the origin to, to the point you're looking at, yeah. Um, so the stress tensor there is 187,500. Zeros everywhere else. Can anyone calculate the principal stresses in their head for this? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Can anyone calculate the maximum shear stress in their head for this? That divided by two, yes. At the middle, in the middle of the cross section, the total stress is just the stress due to tension because y is equal to zero. So you just have 37,500. Zero, 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 zero. Um, and then let's do the bottom. Um, so sigma xx is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the sixth times negative 0.1. That's the y value plus 37,500. So we get for that. Negative 112,500. So the stress tensor is negative 112,500 zeros um, and the principal stresses are the diagonals of that because there's no shears and the max shear is half of that so what that tells us is I mean these are only three points but um, it's a linear relationship with y so you know you can sort of see the trend here but um, the biggest shear stress thinking of absolute value comes at the top of the beam, and so that's where you're most likely concerned about this breaking. It's bending like this. Oh, no, it's bending down. It's bending down, and that's why, so you can always tell from the direction of the tension that um, it's, uh, let's see, 
the longer is the convex side. The longer side is the convex side, and the shorter is the concave side. Yep. But if there wasn't that, um, if we hadn't put that tension on it, you know, those external horizontal forces, it would be equal on the top and the bottom. Just one would be in tension and one would be in compression. Uh, no, the top and bottom would be equally bad and the middle would be, would have no stress on it at all. And this idea is something that you can actually use if you know how a beam is going to be bent, you know. Um, you can apply a artificial, you know, tension or compression on the beam for no reason other than to counteract the stresses that are going to come from your bending, you know. So that's called preloading. Uh, yeah, you know, we won't do this too often. Usually what we're going to do is just calculate it at a single point. But um, So we're going to more just go point by point. And I, I just wanted to do it once in, as a function of Y so you could see how it varies over the cross-section. But yes, you would, it would matter then. Uh, y wouldn't be the only thing that mattered when we get, go to torque. Okay.